So welcome everybody. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, whoever is watching it on different places in the world. Uh, this is a webinar from the IFSO North America chapter. Uh, my name is Jaime Ponce. I'm a bariatric surgeon in Chattanooga, Tennessee in the United States, and uh, I'm the present president of the North America chapter. And we have a very interesting webinar. The topic is, are we where we want it to be in bariatric uh, robotic surgery? And I wanted to just uh, think about this. You know, uh, robotics have been available commercially in the United States and in North America probably close to 25 years. So this is a long time. But uh, initially, the robotic devices were not used widely. Um, eventually, urologists start finding a niche to uh, figure out how to use it in prostatectomies for a narrow space and more ergonomics. But if you think about bariatric surgery, um, 10 years ago, probably the number of cases done robotic, robotically were less than 5%. And the reasons were many. Uh, some of them were like bariatric surgeons, laparoscopic. They uh, are skilled surgeons working on difficult patients. They didn't think that they needed robotic to do the case. And also the instrumentation was not good. And was many of the instrumentation was still being used hybrid, meaning that we didn't have staplers robotically. We didn't have energy robotically. And surgeons had to combine using laparoscopic devices with the robotics. But uh, in 2022, uh, we just recently published the numbers from the SMBS and uh, based on MBS AQIP and the best estimation, 30% of the cases in 2022 were done robotically in bariatric surgery in the United States. And I think if we move forward to now, it's probably close to 40%. So there's an exponential growth over the last few years in bariatric surgery. So the question is, are we where we want it to be? And we have two great speakers. Um, both are very good friends of mine, colleagues. Uh, both are community-based surgeons. Um, uh, first, we have uh, Monique Hassan. She's at the Temple, Texas, uh, associated to Baylor Scott and White Clinic. Um, and she is a fully robotic bariatric surgeon. And then we have Helmut Billy. Uh, he's also a community surgeon in Ventura, California. And he's going to give us the other viewpoint. They both are members of the executive council of the SMBS. And then we're going to have a panel. And just to remind you, you can uh, ask any questions. Uh, just go to the Q&A uh, section and, and post your questions there. And also another reminder, uh, this webinar is going to be recorded. And uh, if so, we'll put it uh, in their YouTube channel and in the um, Facebook uh, If So Academy um, page. The panel, um, I'm just so happy to have this great panel. Uh, many of them have a lot of experience with robotics. Uh, we have Farah Hussein. Uh, she's uh, also a member of the Executive Council of the SMBS. She's the Division Chief of Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery at University of Arizona in Phoenix. Then we have Rana Pulat, another um, known uh, bariatric, bariatric robotic surgeon. Uh, he is the Division's Chief of also of uh, forgot and metabolic surgery at the uh, Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. Both are members of the Executive Council as well. Then I have uh, Pierre Garneau, which uh, he's our representative member at large uh, from Canada, uh, from our other society in Canada, CAPS. He is uh, a professor of surgery and chief of the surgical department at University of Montreal in Canada. And he's also in charge of the fellowship of minimal invasive, including robotic surgery. And Samar Matar, uh, my colleague, uh, he is at Baylor in Houston, a professor of surgery, also past president of the SMBS. And he is acting now as the vice president of the North America chapter. So with uh, further ado, we are going to have the two presentations. We're going to start with Monique, and then we're going to follow up with Helmut. So let's start, Monique. Good morning. My name is Monique Hassan. I'm a bariatric surgeon in Temple, Texas. And thank you so much to IFSO and Dr. Ponce for the opportunity to be involved in today's program. These are my disclosures, including I am a totally 100% robotic surgeon. So I think it's appropriate to start off today's discussion with a case. This patient is a 30-year-old female, BMI of 90, 574 pounds, who presented with several medical comorbidities, as you can see there, 
She underwent an attempt at a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, which was aborted due to the inability to establish an appropriate pneumoperitoneum and visualize the proximal stomach. Unfortunately, she was instructed to resume a diet and exercise regimen with a plan to return in three to six months for a surgical reintervention. So I think this case demonstrates a real missed opportunity and a failure of the available technology resulting in delay of life-saving treatment. So we can't talk about where we are now if we don't talk about our history. The idea of robotics and surgery really began more than 50 years ago as laparoscopy became more mainstream and as a way to overcome some of its limitations. In 1985, the Puma 560 was the first non-laparoscopic robotic device used to assist in neurosurgical procedures. In 1992, the first FDA-approved robot was the RoboDoc, uh, which, assisted to cr uh, which was created to assist in hip replacement surgeries. All of these robots, though, were directly controlled from the bedside, and until telepresent surgery was introduced after a joint effort by NASA and Stanford Research Industry Institute under contract by the U.S. Army, um, the hope was to bring the surgeon to the wounded soldier on the battlefield. So scientists working with the military developed the ASOP system. Uh, to provide a robotic first assist for positioning and using the laparoscopic camera. Integrated surgical systems, which we now know as intuitive, uh, developed the first commercial robots in the late 90s. And at around the same time, Computer Motion introduced Zeus, which was a robotic system that combined the camera holder with laparoscopic instrumentation. In March of 1997, the first true cholecystectomy was performed in Belgium using Mona, created by Intuitive Surgical, by Dr. Himpens and Cartier. And after some redesigning, the da Vinci system, similar to what we know of it, uh, was born and received approval for general laparoscopic surgery in 2000. And then in 2001, a transatlantic cholecystectomy was performed using Zeus, proving that telesurgery employing a robotic system was in fact possible. The clinical use of robotics has rapidly evolved over the last 25 years. Uh, the Da Vinci XI system was approved in 2014 that allows for multi-quadrant surgery. In 2017, Synhance became the second developer to gain FDA approval for a multi-port platform. And at the same time in Korea, the Revo I was approved. There have been multiple endoluminal platforms that have emerged. And in 2019, the Versius platform out of the UK was introduced um, it, with a different design to approach some of the ergonomic challenges that we face as robotic surgeons. Um, there have been some rapid enhancements in technology and instrumentation within this space, leading to approvals of newer systems such as the Hugo from Medtronic, which is another modular system, and the mini uh, robotic space has really expanded, especially with Mira by Virtual Incision, which was recently used in space. So with respect to bariatric surgery, the overall use of robotics has significantly also grown over the last 25 years. And in this study published by El Charak colleagues, uh, the authors really found that there was a consistent increase in the utilization of robotics for all surgical procedures within the bariatric space. And the annual growth slope for each procedure was approximately over 2%, with the greatest increase of 2.4% seen in revisional surgery, which I think should be expected given the rise of revisional surgery over the past few years. So as we know, conventional laparoscopy does have defined advantages. Um, it's well-established, it's affordable, it's available at most hospitals, it also pr provides some tactile feedback, allowing one to sense how much pressure you're putting on the various tissues. However, the, disadvantage are, is, the disadvantages are plenty. The loss of 3D vision, dexterity is compromised, the motions are really just limited to up and down or left to right. And then there is the fulcrum effect, by where the instrument tips move in the opposite direction of the surgeon's hand around the port site. That's counterintuitive. 
And then we all know that tremors are significantly amplified in laparoscopy. So robotic surgery has really taken all of these disadvantages and turned them really into strengths. So robotic surgery can give surgeons some of the benefits of open surgery, such as fluid motion and complete visual range without a large incision. So robotic systems are typically equipped with high definition cameras that can provide detailed and magnified views of the surgical field. So as you can see here in open, you definitely can see everything and you can have complete um, range of motion, um, but there is a disadvantage of a large incision. As you can see here, a perforated marginal ulcer, um, robotically, the 3D visualization is incredible. The camera provides stereoscopic 3D vision, allowing the surgeons to really perceive depth accurately and enhancing spatial awareness to better understand that three-dimensional anatomy of your surgical site. Camera stabilization has also been integral to all the robotic platforms that you see here. The stabilizing mechanisms mitigate hand tremors, resulting in smoother camera movements. This reduction in the tremor improves, obviously, the clarity of the surgical field and allows for better visualization of the anatomical structures, as well as finer surgical maneuvers. So as you can see here in this video, courtesy of Dr. Kukrasia, it's a great comparison between laparoscopy and robotics in terms of the performance of a difficult EJ anastomosis. The stability of the robotic camera system helps to maintain the consistent perspective of the surgical field in a complex case such as this um, while improving surgical efficiency. The introduction of endo wrist instruments has also been a total game changer, especially for revisional bariatric surgery. Um, and we know that lysis of adhesions can be the rate limiting step for these cases. So the robotic instruments can mimic the natural movements of the wrist, um, but offer enhanced dexterity and precision. This increased dexterity is especially beneficial and can reduce the risk of inadvertent injury to surrounding structures. And also the articulating tips of the instruments can enable access to difficult to reach areas, facilitating the progression or completion of more of, the comp of, of this complex case. Um, and so obviously we know that this can help in terms of maximizing patient outcomes. The integration of advanced energy capabilities as well as stapling technology onto robotic platforms has also been a significant advancement especially in robotic bariatric surgery, as the traditional systems have really highly relied on bedside assistance. So the robotic stapler that can be controlled directly from the surgeon's console and equipped with various advanced features can really have advantages. As we all know, stapling is a critical step in any successful bariatric procedures, and that can be a topic all on its own. But in this video, you can see the creation of the GJ anastomosis, the integration of the advanced energy, as well as the stapling capabilities directly into the robotic platform allows a surgeon to perform complex operations with greater autonomy and precision and efficiency. So improved ergonomics is also a key advantage of robotic surgical platforms when compared with laparoscopy. And again, that can be an entire talk on its own, um, but we do know from several data, several studies that robotic surgical platforms do offer enhanced ergonomics. Um, there, this study here that showed a definitely identified low risk ergonomic stress in surgeons performing bariatric surgery robotically compared to medium risk stress laparoscopically. And in this paper, they also suggested some ergonomic guidelines that should be employed, um, especially in educational materials to improve identification and mitigation of ergonomic risks in the operating room. So as we all know, robotic surgeons sit at a console. This seated position tends to reduce the strain on the surgeon's back, neck, and shoulders compared to standing for long periods of time, especially compared to traditional laparoscopic procedures. Um, these consoles are designed for adjustable, with adjustable settings for height, tilt, armrests, um, to allow you to really customize your workspace for optimal comfort and ergonomic alignment. 
And this adaptability helps to reduce risk of multi, multi musculoskeletal injury, excuse me. So for example, when using the Da Vinci Surgeon Console, it's recommended to keep your elbows close to the body, bent at a 90 degree angle with your forearms rested on the armrest. The Versius platform in comparison um, is an open console system and it can be operated standing or sitting per the surgeon's preference. And having an open and flexible design really does facilitate more of an ergonomic workspace. In addition, the uh, robotic surgical system provides direct hand-eye coordination interface. So the surgeon's hand movements at the console are translated precisely to the movements of the robotic instruments inside the patient's body. So that natural alignment between the hand and your visual feedback helps to reduce cognitive load and enhances your precision. And also by minimizing the need for repetitive move movements as well as awkward postures, these robotic platforms really do help reduce physical strain and fatigue um, on surgeons. And that can overall lead to improved surgeon well-being, decreased risk of occupational injuries, and enhanced overall performance, which ultimately benefits patient care and improves the surgical outcome. So robotic platforms have really come a long way. Um, they do provide a structured and controlled learning environment, allowing instructors to guide trainees through complex procedures in a step-by-step -step fashion, similar to laparoscopy. However, these platforms tend to have a more robust simulation module or virtual reality training platform that really kind of allows residents to practice their surgical techniques in a risk-free environment. In addition, I think that robotic uh, platforms really enable real-time mentorship, something that laparoscopy does not have. Um, 3D telestration technology allows experienced surgeons to remotely guide trainees during uh, the procedure for immediate feedback and corrections and enhanced learning. Also, I think that robotic platforms and robotic surgery in general encourages a multidisciplinary team approach. Surgeons, nurses, surgical techs, assistants all work together collaboratively um, and this allows residents to learn, at, learn from and interact with several members of the surgical team, gaining valuable insights into teamwork and communication skills. So I think by leveraging all of these benefits, training programs really can prepare the next generation of surgeons for successful careers in minimally invasive surgery. So nothing is worth its weight without data, of course. Over the past few years, these robotic platforms have really evolved to record a wealth of data during procedures to include instrument movement, camera angles, um, uh, system settings. Uh, this operative data logging can really provide a detailed record of the surgical process, and that can be valuable for performance analysis, quality assurance, and research purposes. Some of the platforms actually incorporate instrument tracking technology, which records precise movements and positions of the surgical instruments throughout the procedure. Um, so for the Intuitive Da Vinci system, this is found on your phone um, in an app called My Intuitive app, and that can be used to assess instrument utilization, efficiency, and accurate accuracy, which can help surgeons really kind of optimize their technique as well as workflows. Uh, in addition, data collection um, definitely for robotic surgery extends beyond just the intraoperative period. And we know that we need to look at postoperative outcomes as well as patient follow-up data. There's been a ton of papers really written about robotic bariatric surgery, looking at factors such as surgical complications, length of stay, and long-term outcomes um, to evaluate the effectiveness of the procedures as well as inform quality improvement initiatives. I think along with the MBSA QIP database, um, a lot of centers also um, offer um, an option to maintain a database of surgical cases and outcomes, and that can also be a valuable research resource for clinical research as well as academic studies. Um, these databases can, can be used to analyze trends, identify best practices, and really generate a wealth of information to help support advancements in robotic surgery. And ultimately, I think the goal of robotic surgery is to really kind of facilitate telemedicine and remote surgery. Um, and we've seen that in the transatlantic cholecystectomy, um, which allows surgeons to perform 
procedures from distant locations um, with the assistance of the robotic system. So also, I think this space is really a fertile ground for innovation and creativity across de de multiple aspects. Um, robotic surgery enables the development and refinement of in in innovative uh, surgical techniques, um, which were previously challenging or almost impossible with our traditional laparoscopic or open methods. Um, surgeons can really explore um, new approaches to complex procedures. So for example, I have been doing three incision uh, sleeve gastrectomy and I could not do that laparoscopically and patients are loving that. Um, the integration of robotics into surgery really also drives development of new instruments um, and devices that are tailored specifically to the platform. Um, for example, the newly launched DB5 um, by Intuitive Surgical provides um, surgeons now with force feedback, something that we've been lacking from laparoscopy, um, and that's the tactile sensation that enhances the, their sense of touch in the actual operation, and that can, uh, this can now set a new standard for surgical robotics. Also, surgical system, these surgical systems often incorporate some sort of advanced imaging technology and um, navigation systems that really enable surgeons to visualize the anatomy in real time with unparalleled clarity and accuracy. Um, Firefly is a great example seen here used for perfusion as well as biliary anatomy visualization. And I think lastly, the conversions of robotics and artificial intelligence really opens up a new frontier for surgical innovation. AI algorithms can analyze a vast amount of surgical data to identify patterns, predict outcomes, and assist surgeons in uh, decision-making um, during procedures, potentially improving patient safety during this, the procedure, as well as reducing the risk of complications and enhancing overall surgical outcomes. So back to our case. Um, our patient presented three years later, she had gained 31 pounds. Um, she was placed on a preoperative diet where she lost about 10 pounds, but now she was a BMI of 94, uh, 595 pounds. Um, so I took my shot um, and um, she was able to undergo a successful robotic uh, assisted sleeve gastrectomy. Um, she was seen six months later. Uh, she's doing great. She's lost 150 pounds and has significant um, improvement in her quality of life. So, so I think we're there. Um, I think we're there for the most part, but I don't think we're finished yet um, because I think there's so much more work to be done. Um, robotics is here to stay. Obesity is a disease and revisions are increasing. I think this is just an additional tool that helps to provide us with more autonomy and precision, especially in our complex cases. I think robotic platforms with AI and machine learning are gonna give us a wealth of uh, data for quality improvement and um, patient outcomes. And it's also gonna help drive our innovation and creativity. Um, the robotic platform also, I think we have to admit that it does help enhance surgeon well-being um, as well as career longevity by improving ergonomics in the operating room. And finally, I think adaptability is the surgeon's most valuable trait. A career as a surgeon cannot stay free of change for years and years. Adaptability is going to help you as a surgeon uh, maintain a consistent level of satisfaction in light of inevitable changes in this um, ever-changing field. So I think it's not about being the strongest or the most intelligent to survive, but I think it's about being the most adaptable to change. So thank you very much. I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, present today and uh, participate in this debate. My topic on the subject of robotic bariatric surgery are where we where we want to be. And my uh, position is no, we have a ways to go. These are my disclosures. And uh, I want to quote Benjamin Franklin to start the whole debate off because he was a wise man and he notified us that we should beware of little expenses because a small leak will sink a great ship. 
Now, my story begins with strawberry fields, and strawberries are all around where I live. And you'll ask, what do strawberries have to do with robotic surgery? But let's take a look. Strawberry production in the United States in 2022 by state, there were really only two states, California producing over 24,800 tons of strawberries, and then there's Florida. And we export 20% of our strawberries outside the country, and that's 20% of the world's supply comes from California. And that's a business industry that's in excess of $1.98 billion a year. And where are strawberries in California grown? Well, they're pretty much grown on the coast of California. I come from Oxnard, California in Ventura, where a significant amount of our, of our strawberries are grown. And we see the field workers picking strawberries really for most of the summer and the spring. And uh, these are the delicious large strawberries we ship all over the world. So we're here to talk about bariatric surgery and what do the field workers and the strawberry industry have to do? Well, it comes down to who actually gets robotic surgery in our culture, in our community. Uh, my hospital was actually built on the former strawberry fields. This hospital that says Dignity, where I work every week, uh, is built on a donated land that was full of strawberry fields. Um, what percentage of the population in the strawberry industry actually rely on government-sponsored health plans will tell the story of who actually gets surgery uh, when they are interested in robotic surgery, and particularly robotic bariatric surgery. And can we afford to offer robotic surgery to everyone in our community? So are we where we need to be to offer robotic bariatric surgery to all those who qualify for bariatric surgery in our community? Well, we work at community hospitals. And just to give you an idea how many community hospitals there are in the United States, there are over 5,130 community hospitals. That's in stark contrast to the academic centers, which are significantly less. There's about 120 to 150 academic health centers in the United States, and those institutions account for just 5% of U.S. hospitals. So the ability to afford this kind of technology and distribute it to a huge percentage of people in the United States is something that is not really happening yet. And this is an area that we need to work on. This is a map of the community hospitals in the United States. And you can see that when you get further and farther to the middle of the country and out west, we have more community hospitals that are sparsely populated in between the big cities. So robotic barrier surgery, getting back to it again, are we where we need to be? How do you measure this concept? Well, let's take a look at cell phones. Are we where we need to be with cell phones? This was my first cell phone I ever got, a Motorola 550. All it did was let me talk. We couldn't text. We couldn't search the internet. Now I have this fancy iPhone 15 which lets me do almost anything. I can get calls from all around the world. I can go to the internet. You all know how spectacular cell phones are. So are we where we need to be? Here's a map of the uncovered parts of the United States in white, where there is no cell phone activity. It looks very similar to the community hospitals. There's big gaps in coverage. So if you live in one of these areas where it's white, we are certainly not where we need to be with cell phones. And trying to improve that so that we have coverage through the entire country is something that's very similar to what we're trying to do with robotic surgery. Coverage equals access to care in the United States and health insurance coverage of the total population of the United States hasn't changed much since 2019. Most people get their insurance, this 49 to 51% from their employer. This is usually a PPO or commercial payer. 19% or so get Medicaid. I think it's down to like 18.5%. Medicare is number three with 14 to 18% in the United States, and the rest are a collection of different insurance plans and the uninsured. So we have almost half of the country getting government type plans, and we see how this affects who can actually get bariatric surgery done with a robot. Now there's some studies that go along with this. Uh, and here was a nationwide readmissions database that allowed these researchers, and they published their results in 2023, to look at over 10 years of robotic-assisted bariatric surgery. And they found it was associated with an increased post-operative complication rate compared to laparoscopic. That's really not what's important, because I don't want to turn this into a tizzy of, no, that's not true, or you can certainly make an argument, this is old data, we have to look at the new data. But there's one part of this study that's extremely pertinent. 
So what they did was they looked on hospitals with adult patients who underwent robotic and laparoscopic between the years of 2010 and 2019. The primary outcomes were intra and post-operative complications, 30 and 90 day all-cause readmissions, and then secondary outcomes, one of which was cost. So what did they find? Of the 1,370 hospitalizations that met criteria, 7.1 or 97,000 were robot cases. The patient's demographic and clinical characteristics was similar. There was a 13% higher adjusted odds rate of complication for robotic cysts. That's were very minor, nausea, vomiting, some acute blood loss, anemia, incisional hernias. And the adjusted odds of a 30 and 90 day readmission, 10% higher for robot assisted and the length of stay between robot and laparoscopic was very similar. So this could be old data, but the part that is the same is hospital costs back from 20, 2012 to 2017, hospital costs were 31% higher, 15,800 versus 12,056. And this is something that may not be sustainable and certainly is affecting who can get robotic surgery. The conclusion was basically 31% increase in cost with some consideration for what the complication rates really were. Now, this is a Swiss healthcare system study and robotic gastric bypass was found that it achieved financial benefits based on their DRG repayments from 2012 to 2014, but they could only do it in selected patients. Wasn't for everybody. Robotic gastric bypass for obesity hit a financial loss and went into deficit in 2015. And the recommendations were, we need more money. Well, that's something that's very difficult to get in the United States. It's certainly not being planned right now. And this was also a recommendation that they should no longer do it at the community hospitals, but refer these to high volume centers which may be a way that this becomes more widespread, but also eliminating it from our thousands of community hospitals that we have. In order to understand your actual costs and how you can improve things, you have to understand something called the contribution margin. You have to actually keep track of how you can help your hospital save money. Otherwise, you don't end up in a situation where you will be able to improve costs. And what contribution margin is, is when you make a product or deliver a service like surgery, and you actually deduct the variable costs of delivering the surgery with the costs of, with the costs, uh, of delivering the product, the leftover revenue is the contribution margin. The aggregate amounts of revenue available after variable costs are considered equals the amount that is used to cover the fixed expenses of that company and its product. So in the operating room, it's the cost of setting up the robot or the laparoscopic tower and all of the little costs that make us able to do this surgery. After we eliminate all of those costs and compare it to the profit that we got paid, that amounts to the profit for the company. If the contribution margin is negative, the company's losing money with each unit it produces. If the contribution margin is negative for surgery, then you're losing money. So you'll, you have three choices. You can drop the product, you can increase the prices, or you can decrease the cost of providing the service. And that's where surgeons fit in to this entire uh, process. So this study, looking at hospital revenue costs and contribution margin, we looked at total joints. Orthopedic surgeons have looked at this for years. And the main thing is that the cost of doing business in orthopedic surgery has been now changed from inpatient only to outpatient. And when you look at patients who were divided into total hips and total knees, what you find is per patient revenues, the total indirect direct costs and the contribution margins are starting to decrease based on whether they're inpatient or outpatient. So in Medicare patients receiving total hips, the contribution margin is 89% lower if they're inpatients compared to outpatients. So what this is doing is pushing patients into the outpatient center. And of course, those with higher comorbidities and those with higher medical problems end up maybe not getting surgery because they're too high risk and the margins are going to be lost into the negative. So Medicare patients and Medicaid patients have been looked at, and it's interesting on government managed plans, the contribution margin is 120% higher for inpatients receiving total hips if they have Medicaid, but 136% higher for patients receiving total knees. If we look at the outpatient and inpatient for Medicare, we have a contribution margin which starts to drop negative 17% for inpatient medical care but positive 143 for outpatient. And this has an effect on who gets surgery. And something similar is going on with robotics. So as we look at the trends, the financial de data demonstrates a downward trend in contribution margin for Medicare and government mandated Medicaid. 
We have to implement cost saving strategies. We have to increase the, uh, because of the increase in direct costs, which we know is always going up, the negative contribution margins over time are gonna deteriorate efficiency unless we do cost saving measures. So when you understand costs, what can surgeons control? We can control length of stay. We can work to get our length of stays down. Many surgeons are now looking at same day discharges. The nursing cost per 24 hours, well, it goes up and is variable based on the number of nurses that are taking care of a patient at any one time. It ranges from 700 to 800 to over $1,000 per night just for that nursing care. Imaging studies, upper GI studies, CT scans, these can all be eliminated and medication costs can be controlled with shorter hospitalizations, lab studies, and physical therapy. When we look at the operating room costs, you have to look at what you choose because it affects contribution margin in different ways. The mechanical staple costs are disposable, staplers, powered versus mechanical have different costs, cartridge costs per vendor, instruments, majority of instruments in laparoscopic surgery are reprocessed. So there's a one-time charge over the life of the instrument. $1,200 for a new needle driver lasts multiple years. One day you may get this email because this comes long after you've actually started implementing your program. This was an email we received where the CEO had disappointing data and was worried about the financial performance of bariatric surgery. Medicaid patients were found to be creating financial losses and laparoscopic cases are running at a loss and robotic cost cases were running at an even larger loss. So can a hospital afford to offer robotic bariatric surgery to Medicaid patients? That's the big question. This kind of chat is not uncommon on the internet now. Here's a robotic surgery collaboration chat and it was the hospital claims we're losing money on both cases. We don't have the best payer mix here in Middle Tennessee. Is anyone else hearing gripes or complaints from the C-suite about the financial impact of the robotic program? As this changes and increases, we're going to see that we can't give the care to everyone we want to. Other variable costs, stapler cartridges and stapler handles. Cartridge one vendor you can see is very close to cartridge two, but car vendor one, his cartridges are cheaper than vendor two. If we look at handles, medium length handles, 100, these are mechanical handles versus 115 for a long, and powered handles have increased costs for the various components that are put to use in order to make them uh, utilize, utilized in the OR. So we can add to another $100, $150 to use that technology. If we look at robots, simply opening a stapler, a 60 stapler will cost you $556 extra, uh, six uses out of the $3,400 used to purchase it, and the 45 stapler will cost you 483. That's basically if you use those two staplers in one case, you're adding $1,000 to the cost of the case. And the various cartridges are slightly higher than the traditional cartridges are. Robotic instruments also have increased cost, and you have to be aware of this in terms of your, your contribution margin. Needle drivers, $136 a use. After 10 uses, you got to buy another one. Five millimeter wristed needle drivers are $290, almost $300 a use. And your various graspers range in price from the high 100s to over $200. So you use four or five instruments, you're at another $1,000 per that case. Drapes cost about $200 a case, and uh, you'll find that you have to be aware of that if you're actually going to lower costs. So who you can use this on depends largely on where you live and the insurance types that each plan has to offer. Different geographic regions have different payer mixes, and some robotic centers are incredibly efficient. They have more than 25 robots, excellent turnovers, excellent teams, outstanding results, limited use of disposables. These large robotic centers also often have no Medicaid. I called four or five centers, talked to my colleagues, and was stunned that none of them are really doing Medicaid compared to our hospital where we have 40% Medicaid. This results in an excellent payer mix. Now, where I live and in my practice, we have field workers, we're on the coast, these are our strawberry fields. Medicaid is 41 to 45%, PPO plans are 35% and HMO plans are 15% with Medicare making 5%. So 40% of the patients I take care of may not get access to robotic bariatric surgery simply because the payer mix won't be able to reimburse enough to keep the robot program going. And this has been looked at, patients insured by Medicare and Medicaid undergo lower rates of bariatric surgery. This was a position statement that came out from the ASMBS and the conclusions were the majority of patients undergoing bariatric surgery are actually insured by private insurance. And despite the fact that we have nearly 20% of the patients who are publicly insured on Medicaid and another 15 to 18 on Medicare, only 13% of those patients are actually getting surgery who are publicly insured. Now in our hospital, 
these are some of the reimbursements that you see. These are commercial payers, and this is for a lap coli. We don't do very much robot, so I didn't want to share data on only a few cases. But here's what lap coli's pay, 12,000 to 18,000 a case with major payers. But then when we look at the Medicaid, it's only $1,300 a case. It hardly covers the cost of doing a robotic cholecystectomy. Here you can see we build out $860,000 on 17 cases and only got paid $142,000 for about an $8,000 reimbursement. Inguinal hernias are very similar. We did five Medicaid cases and they reimbursed $1,300 per case with the robot system. 2,500,000 billed out, only 367,000 paid to our hospital. And the same thing is similar with prostatectomies. Medicaid patients do not get good access. Here is a Medicaid one case paid four thousand versus twelve to thirty thousand from the commercial payers. Not two million out and uh, and less than three hundred thousand paid. So how are we going to enter the realm of being able to afford the technology? Community hospitals see the benefits of implementing technology, but we're limited by limited funds. What can we afford and how are we gonna actually be able to implement it? The ability to implement specific types of technology has monetary limitations. You have to realize there's a difference and utilize your technology to maximize benefits in your, in your uh, community and to try to distribute bari uh, bariatric surgery with robots to the most people you can if it's actually true that the robot gives better results and better outcomes, but that's a different debate. Corporate, university, and academic hospitals have a completely different sort of funding, and they can often distribute the care among a wider variety of insurance plans versus small rural hospitals. So what kind of hospital do you work in? I work in the hospital where the technology of a crop duster, we see this every day where we are, especially when they're having planting seasons. We just need simple technology, but maybe we can get something better. Lowering cost, what about competition? What about different robotic uh, type platforms. The Da Vinci is more or less the space shuttle of what we have to offer technologically, and maybe that itself is what's causing us to have uh, problems with respect to implementing uh, the robot on everybody. Maybe there's a cheaper option. Maybe there's different robots, single-armed robots, double-armed robots, things that we can utilize for specific benefits of the robot without implementing such an expensive and technologically sophisticated system, such as what we see with the Da Vinci, which holds the market share. So in summary, you need to calculate the cost and contribution margin for your program, while at the same time understanding that 18% of the U.S. population is not getting access to care because they're Medicaid. Medicaid is almost impossible to meet robotic financial benchmarks, so that has to be taken into account with any robotic program. Access to robotic bariatric care is limited in Medicaid patients, and robot surgery has not yet achieved sufficient access to care for anywhere between 18 to 40% of our population, they simply can't sustain a program with such poor reimbursements. What can you do? You can know the cost required to do each robotic operation. You can manage the cost to keep the robotic program in the black, and whenever possible, keep the contribution margin positive, certainly for the whole program. This can be done with understanding the cost that each of your vendor provides and maximizing the use of vendors available and understanding your payer mix and the end effect on the contribution margin each insurance plan has. Until we can offer robot operations to the 18% on Medicaid, we will have much work to do in the United States with respect to actually offering this technology to the number of people that deserve it. So I hope that our hospital will one day be able to move on from a crop duster that's rather simple to something that is much more sophisticated and able to give out the care that we all hope our patients can receive. Thank you. And I hope you join us all in uh, the IFSO World Congress occurring in the 3rd uh, to 6th of September, 2024. Excellent. Excellent, great uh, presentations and good arguments. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you to comment briefly on a couple of things before we go to the panel. So Helmut, you made a very strong argument about the cost. Um, and so if the cost was not an issue, do you see robotic surgery having an added value for the surgeons? And well, a question for Monique, before you answer that, you know, you made a point that it, we, we're almost there uh, with the value of the robotics, but when are we gonna be able to actually have complete automation, meaning that the robot can do full tasks or even a surgery like a car, electrical car can drive itself. So Helmut. 
Well, I, I think uh, the robot may be one of the most technologically fascinating and significant advancements that we've seen in our careers. Certainly, it was eye-opening when we first saw laparoscopy. You remember we were sitting in the back row and I listened to all the older surgeons. One leaned over to me once when I was an intern and said, good thing this won't catch on and, and look where we are today. The, the robot is definitely here to stay um, and it's going to be mean something different to each surgeon. And many of the surgeons being trained today are so technically talented with the robot that uh, it's hard to imagine them ever going back to laparoscopy. And then you have surgeons that are hybrid surgeons like myself. I can do the robot, I can use the robot, but do I see a difference in outcome compared to what I've accomplished laparoscopically? For people of my generation, it's probably no, we don't see a major improvement. Um, I hope to get as good on the robot as I am today laparoscopically, and I deal with the challenges of how to in give informed consent to a patient where I'm practicing to get as good as I am now uh, with the hope that somehow it's gonna be better. So with time, you know, the surgeons like myself will fade away and we'll have surgeons like Monique that are running most of these uh, uh, departments and she will be training and affecting the surgeons for generations to come. Uh, it, I, I see it very much the way we saw laparoscopy when we were young surgeons. Uh, and it's definitely a step forward, uh, but one that has more cost and one that has, you know, there's only a runway of so long and uh, the reason crop justers are these short little stubby planes is so they can land on short runways. And it makes you wonder what the financial viability of our hospitals are that have these short financial runways. Monique? Yeah, um, I, uh, <laughs> I think that we are getting close to where it's gonna be um, pretty automated, um, but I don't think we're ever gonna get there. Um, I. Uh, most most people don't know this, but I am a huge fan of technology. I have a Tesla. I have the you know 2024 model, and it has autopilot. And let me tell you, it's not perfect. It sucks sometimes. It doesn't know where all the things are. And so you can start driving and you have to take over. So I don't think that we're ever gonna get 100% automated um, in terms of robotic surgery, because I think we're still gonna need to be there in order to you know, make clinical decisions real time. Um, you know, there are going to be some cases, obviously, where you can kind of let it go on its own, uh, potentially, but I don't think that we're ever going to get to be 100% automated. So uh, Farah and Rana are good robotic surgeons in the United States. Um, any comments from both of you, Farah, any comments from for the speakers? First, thank you both. That was very enlightening. I, I loved both of your talks. And I think you, you hit on both the advantage as well as the big disadvantage right now, which might be talking about global equity and access to robotics, which I think is something a lot of us struggle with, is how do we make sure that all communities have access to the new technology that's coming out and, and to all of the benefits of that as well. So even beyond the US, I think there are a lot of countries that have struggled to even bring robotics into their area. So I guess my challenge to the industry would be, how do we do that? How do we make this something that can reach every community, uh, particularly if it does help outcomes and improves uh, patient outcomes overall? I think that's a really important thing that we need to focus on in the future. Rana, are you available to make a comment? Yeah, uh, great presentations. Um, I love both arguments. Um, I heard more about strawberry fields than I wanted to, but <laughs> but I think Helmut's point uh, is well taken. We are still not there uh, cost-wise, but we will get there soon. And uh, the cost threshold is dependent on each uh, hospital system and each surgeon. So if a surgeon is able to extend uh, uh, services that he otherwise would not be able to, then that makes up for the uh, cost differential. Summer? Yes, thank you. So I'd like to uh, give a, uh, the perspective of a novice to uh, robotic surgery. I just had a, a few cases over the last few weeks, and I, I have to admit, Monique and Farah and everybody here, that it is, it is uh, uh, comfortable and ergonomically very satisfying. The, the view is beautiful, and I enjoyed doing them. However, you know, there is the elephant in the room that Helmut brought up, 
and that is uh, the cost and more likely the value uh, to the patient and what it entails. I, uh, it is very true, Helmut, what you're saying. I just had a call just this week from a surgeon who's, who's having to leave his hospital because they can't afford to supply him with robotic equipment. And uh, they said, sorry, we can't support you anymore. So he's looking for another hospital to operate on. It's a sad situation. But that brings me to think, you know, your, your talk was mostly focused on the United States and the payer mix here. But we have an international audience here today. And um, I just don't know. I know we have some industry people um, attending. But I just don't know how we are going to uh, universalize the use of this technology, especially as with all the uh, technological advances that are happening and are, uh, especially with AI and other uh, additions to it, how, how we're going to uh, have people afford this. And it goes back to the patient. You know, it, it's comfortable for the surgeon uh, but what value, what added value does it give to the patient? Monique, um, what do you think? Oh, um, I was going to say, I mean, I, I agree with you. Two points. Number one, did you guys have this conversation when laparoscopy was, was introduced? What value does it bring to the patients? I mean, I think that for me in my practice, I definitely like that patient that underwent an unsuccessful laparoscopic surgery. I mean, she got no care, right? Like, you know, we said, oh, we can't help you because we just don't have the technology available. I think that it extends our practice, our ability to take care of complex patients. We can offer more surgeries. And again, obesity is a chronic disease. We're doing, we're doing more revisions, more complex cases. And I think that this is going to allow us to do that. I mean, I know that in my practice, revisions are increasing and there's no way with laparoscopy on a, you know, BMI of 80, that I'm going to do a really complex revision with a laparoscope. Um, it's just not gonna, it, it just won't happen for a long case. Um, I will bail out or we just, we just give subpar care to our patients. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm I just concerned about surgeons who state they are a hundred percent robotic mm -hmm. and I, I can understand the, the role of robotics in uh, class five, uh, clinical obesity or complex revisional cases, but there are surgeons who apply robotics to every single operation. Mm -hmm. gallbladders, hernias, umbilical hernias. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think this will just keep driving the prices up, the cost of health care. I, I think uh, and that's sort of what I'm seeing, uh, Samer. We can all tell stories. We can. I just had one of my residents who's obviously trained with us, so he's very capable with laparoscopy, who had the robotic surgeon on the gallbladder say the gallbladder is too difficult. It needs to be done open. He skipped over the entire possibility of laparoscopy, and it went to my fellow resident who's now in attending, and he did it laparoscopically the next day. So this ping pong match of all of this really misses the point. I think the Swiss study that I pointed out is the one that's the most telling, because not only was the recommendation we need more money, which makes sense to all of us, but they were going to decentralize the care from the community surgery programs to centralize it at at individual academic centers where perhaps the technology was going to be used in a more cost-efficient manner on less patients. Uh, this, this is a very dangerous transition we go through if community programs can't utilize the technology or are over-utilizing the technology. That's kind of why I showed, you know, $1,200 for a gallbladder, $1,300 for an inguinal hernia, and to set up a highly expensive system that those are all money losing cases where they need to at least break even to prevent the downfall of a technological, really remarkable technology. Who knows where it will go? I look forward to the day that I can have an assistant that's AI controlled robotic arm and I can say retract the gallbladder and it knows exactly what I'm doing. I mean, the future of this is, is really limited by our own imagination. We have AI systems that can actually fly military jets. So where we go with this is going to be shepherded by how we utilize the cost. And, uh, and I hope everyone can still be a laparoscopic surgeon. I know Monique can be a laparoscopic surgeon. Um, it's it's kind of <laughs> like 
driving an electric car. Sure. I got an electric car for the first time and I was amazed by how cool it actually was. But if I run out of power, now what do I do? So I have to manage <laughs> each system to the so best of I think I so think it's inevitable that progress is expensive. Like when you right. talked about mechanical staplers uh, versus hand suturing, staplers are more expensive. They were single use and they, you know, you had old generation surgeons who said you could sew up the bowel faster than you could staple. So progress is expensive and we just have to figure out how um, how best to shepherd it. Yeah, go, going to the moon is expensive, but Pierre works in a country in which they have socialized medicine uh, in Canada. Yeah. And so cost could be seen a different viewpoint. So what is the situation in Canada in regards to using the robot? Does it cost more money? Is the government limiting you the use because of the cost? You know, first thing, uh, Amy, I'm sitting exactly in between Monique and Helmut. I'm a big yeah. technology fan. I'm using robotic uh, surgery for my most complex bariatric cases. But on the other side, like you said, we're living in a public system. And yeah. it's like uh, Medicare. That's mean a lot of hospitals have a limitation. And that probably is my would be my question about uh, what what do you think about the future of robotic surgery in a public system where there's a limit amount of money there's no private surgery for robotic surgery in canada and by far we have less robot by a citizen in canada than the us and most of the time if you look at actually the, the government pay mostly for uh, prostate surgery and gynecology surgery they don't provide extra money for general surgery or bariatric surgery or even thoracic surgery. That means uh, each hospital who offer a procedure outside of the prostate or gynecology, they're losing money. Wow. And my question to Monique and uh, Elma, do you think that we need in our system or any Medicare system, because technology we know is the future, we need to understand the technology, but do you think we need to limit the, the use of the robot for specific case with criteria, specific criteria based on a national committee? What do you think about that? Well, it, I'll, I'll jump in on that because one of the points Samer made was doing every case with the robot. And so we can look first at the low hanging fruit. I, I do append appendectomies because I take ER call five times a month. Should we be doing appendectomies with the robot? Every single one. The average appendectomy can take eight to 12 minutes with an experienced laparoscopic surgeon, maybe half an hour with your resident. Is that a good utilization of the robot? I think most people would argue that, yeah, it's probably not a good utilization of the robot for every single appendectomy. And then we just have to agree on that and move up the scale. So should we do simple gallbladders with the robot or should we utilize the more complex cases like, like Monique showed, perforations, difficult to visualize areas where the 3D is going to make a difference. Well, which gallbladders are they? Until we do that, we can't change this trend we're on. And, you know, there is only so much money. So we start with the low-hanging fruit. And as hospitals, each one will decide how that technology is going to be used. Monique. Uh, yeah, my only concern about that is, uh, you know, I think in order for you to be a accomplished surgeon, I think that you really have to um, really uh, get good at those low hanging fruit cases, right? So I think that your complication rate, your um, learning curve is going to be extended much longer if you pick and choose. Um, I you know, when I was going through this journey, I decided, okay, let's let's just jump right in. And if it wasn't cost beneficial um, to my patient, then I really wasn't going to kind of pursue this technology. And for me and our hospital, we sat down and we were really cost conscious. I think early on when you are starting you tend to open all the things that you normally would open in a laparoscopic case. And I think that that hinders a lot of robotic surgeons that are trying to really be masters at robotic surgery is that, you know, you think it's going to be exactly the same. And I think that that's the problem with trying to go back and forth. It confuses people, especially within the operating room. And I think it slows down your turnovers. I think it slows down your whole case if you try to do flip back and forth. Um, so I think you do have to start. And I think that Rana's right. Initially, 
development of technology and development of a new surgical line is going to be a little bit expensive. And so you have to, until you're proficient, I think you're going to, your costs are going to be high initially. I mean, it's the same for the, you know, car industry, right? So now you kind of have more competitors coming into the space with all these different robotic platforms. I think that cost is going to come down overall in the next few years. So. So uh, both uh, Rana and Monique have experience with the newly approved technology, the Da Vinci 5 uh, by the FDA. I think it was approved last month. Um, and one of the features that he has, one of the questions that we have the attendees is what are, what are the improvements that we have on this device for bariatrics? And I was going to expand on that. You know, I know one of the improvements is getting haptic feedback or force feedback, like Rana mentioned. But for many years, we've been told that we don't need that. Right. Monique, you told me that that can be done and you just don't don't need it because you feel it. You you yeah. visual that. So is that going to be an added value actually or I or think we're going to learn to to use it? Yeah, I think it's actually I think where it really adds value honestly is um new learners um and you know trainees. I think that you'll because there's a feature you can you can as a feature you can turn it off or you can turn it on. You can put it on low, medium and high. Um and I think it's really beneficial for newer learners to kind of understand and see the tissues, especially when you're running bowel or even in an emergency case where it's a bowel obstruction things like that. Um so I do think it's valuable there. The other valuable feature of the new system is that it's more streamlined. So all of the things that we talk about with cost, it's not there anymore because everything is really streamlined in the patient cart. So all of your insufflator, all of that stuff is all streamlined. So you don't need as many towers. You can actually drop that into a small space. Um, we're thinking about getting it for our um our outpatient center, which is technically still within the hospital, but they would have to do construction in order to fit in the, the regular XI. Um, and so with the DV5, they don't necessarily have to do that because it's really kind of a smaller footprint overall. Um, so I think some of the cost things are really kind of looking at, at Helmut's, you know, point, um, it really will help with the, the new technology. Um, and as somebody who trains residents, um, one of the other great features I think is um, digital swap. It's a little bit more uh, responsive in terms of switching arms, as well as the arrow to you know point to different things for telestration and teaching um, new learners is a little bit bigger. Um, so for me, I thought that that was really exciting um, and it, as well as the, the streamlined nature of everything, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I think in, in about a few cases, your eyes get used to it. Uh, but as Monique mentioned, for a new learner, this is exceptionally useful. But to touch upon Pierre's point, in Canada, the gynecologists and the urologists are paid um, extra for robotics. You know, the hospital gets paid. And the reason for that is the gynecologists and urologists cannot do that case otherwise in a minimally invasive fashion. And that is happening in the U.S., as we speak, our next generation of surgeons, they have different strengths. They have enormous strengths in a lot of things, and they don't want to go through the traditional laparoscopic route. They have chosen robotic surgery, and that's the way it's going to be. I think the critical mass of surgeons have turned, and there's no putting it back into the bottle. As an educator, we have to realize that that's happened in this country much earlier than other countries, but I think the same thing will happen across the world. Really, Rana, I, I, I don't know. I mean, we have a lot of uh, uh, international surgeons here in the audience, and I've seen some of the questions, and they would like to get their hands on, on robotic technology, but it's, it's beyond their, their reach. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a, a representative from industry on the panel here, but I would like to ask them, you know how medications have different prices in different uh, regions of the world. I wonder if they've considered doing, you know, special pricing for, uh, for countries that, um, th that are not uh, first tier, so to speak. So, <clears throat> Samer, I can speak a little bit about uh, systems that are being developed in Asia that are uh, uh, much, much less expensive but they don't give you the 100% Da Vinci experience that Intuitive has. It's 
much more rudimentary. And but over time, I'm sure all of those systems will um, will get better um, and at a at a much lower price. And Intu Intuitive is the market leader, and they're a smart company, and they will adapt and they will tier price or uh, do it procedure wise. Um, so you know that all of that is coming, and I think it's it's going to be good for the entire um, industry. You know, the, there's one area we haven't touched on. And, and that's the maintenance of these expensive platforms. So it's one thing to have a hospital in the desert in North Africa with a device, but when it needs maintenance, now the device is down. I mean, if you look at Cuba, the way they kept American cars going, despite the fact they were embargoed, um, all those cars needed maintenance. And the stories of how they skeletonized carburetors off cars that weren't even made for American vehicles to keep them running. We're talking about a much more sophisticated platform here so that has to also be incorporated simplicity and ease of maintenance uh, is something that we still have to look forward to in the future we haven't talked about the hundreds of thousands of dollars required per robot to keep them maintained in the united states um, that uh, part i left out of my talk because i didn't think it was something that we could control and it was also something that can be put into different pots of money so how robots get into our hospital and how they're maintained is a completely separate discussion, but the maintenance part is important. If you're a totally robotic surgeon and your machine goes down and you don't have four or five others and that's all you do, how long do you wait for the machine to come back up? It's all intertwined. I think it depends on the case. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. Uh, so based on that, so is in many, in many things, competition can drive the cost down. And so we've been having a big player in the market for many years. Um, there's other couple of big players that may come up in the future. I don't know, the Hugo from Medtronic, another big company, the Otaba from J&J &J and some other ones. Um, those may be something that may help to drive the cost you think down or you think it's not going to affect it and all the companies are going to be charging the same thing i think it's going to drive the, i think it's going to drive the cost down um i think that you know if you look at um the i don't know if anybody's seen the medtronic hugo but one of the advantages is that all of that laparoscopic equipment that you already have is compatible with it yeah. um the DV5 as well, I mean, I think that that was a cost, you know, when you think about the cost, all of the things that you're using now with your XI are compatible with DV5. Um, so I think that the companies are understanding that that is an issue um, and they're not trying to, you know, I think even with the contracts um, that, that you know, Intuitive has with the AMP program, I think that they're understanding that, yeah, cost is, a, is an issue, but I think that when we talk about this in general, I think we should talk about the fact that at the end of the day, we're all here to treat the disease of obesity and we need the actual tool and the best technology to treat those patients. And I think that, you know, all of the platforms that are coming out now are thinking about that um, and they're trying to focus on having us have the best technology in order to treat our patients. Right. Anybody else have? Uh, Yes, go yeah, ahead, Rana. All of these com all of these companies, you know, especially they've developed this market. They're not they're not stupid. They're they're not going to kill the golden goose, you know. Mm -hmm. So they are going to um, figure out how to make this work. Um, and I think competition will will help. But it also tells me how much uh, you know how difficult it is to build a robot when I see you know um, other companies trying to catch up. Um, and this is one industry where you you have a market leader for 15 years. It's kind of unheard of if you look at uh, technology. So it'll be interesting to see how. Well, in a few years now, Rana, the other the other ways of uh, cost containment is like what Helmut mentioned. You know, like maybe the Hugo can be used uh, one or two arms in one OR, and then that can divide the use of the robot on different. So it's just dividing the cost uh, among two ORs instead of just contain all the cost in one OR. So those are the different things. Um, we're already at the hour time, a little bit over. So any final comments from anybody? Any big pressing comments, Summer? 
I'm just, uh, I, I, I've, I found this a very uh, uh, stimulating, exhilarating uh, session. I've learned a lot today and I'd like to just thank IFSO and uh, the, the speakers for, uh, and the other, and my fellow panelists for a fantastic session. Great, great speakers. Uh, thank you for all the panel. And I want to remind everybody that we have the IFSO World Congress in Melbourne, Australia in September, first week of September this year. So if you ever wanted to go to Australia, this is the time. Uh, not only is it going to be in a great city, but also it's just close to other things to have fun. And during the IFSO meeting, uh, we're going to have the first uh, hands-on course, robotic course that is run by Eric Wilson. And I understand that, Rana, you're going to be on that course as well? And Rogers? Yes. And uh, Michael so Talbot. And Michael Talbot from Australia. So it's, it's going to be great for anybody that is interested in robotics. Uh, so I look forward for everybody. I remember this session is recorded, so you can watch it there later on. And thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Thank you.